Thanks, Jim. I am Lauren Phipps, Director and Senior Analyst on the Circular Economy here at GreenBiz, and it is my pleasure to interview our next speaker on why companies must make their net zero transition also a just transition, and what it looks like to do so in practice. I'm joined by Carbon 180's Deputy Director of Policy, Ubad Kosar. Ubad leads the organization's environmental justice initiative and forestry efforts, and we are so lucky to have her with here, have her here with us today. Thank you, Ubad. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to share and to just dig into this really important topic today. Well, we don't have a ton of time, so I want to start with the basics and level set a little bit. Similar to the phrase sustainability, or I think even net zero at this event, we've seen the concept of a just transition tossed around quite a bit, and it has extremely different definitions and implications. Level set, what do we mean by the phrase just transition? That's a really great place to start. Um, when most folks think about a just transition, often the first thing that really comes to mind is jobs. So specifically protecting or maintaining jobs as we sort of transition to this clean economy. And that's true, but there's a lot more to it than just that. The Just Transition Alliance, um, I think does a fantastic job of really outlining what the expansive definition of this is by saying it's a principle, it's a process and it's a set of practices. The principles piece first is that we can have a clean economy and we can have a healthy and prosperous economy while also protecting the environment. So these things can coexist. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. The process to getting there is inclusive and that does not put undue burden on workers or communities or for those losses that are experienced that they're adequately compensated. And then lastly, the practice, which is my favorite part, is really emphasizing just and just transition, which is that the most vulnerable to climate action or excuse me, to climate change, um, those that are most economically unstable are also at the forefront of really crafting these solutions and ways we're going to move forward. So I just wanna highlight, it's not just transitioning into low or zero carbon uh, emissions or jobs, but transitioning into a more regenerative economy that also protects the dignity of workers and their communities. Lastly, um, I think it's really important to ensure that businesses are considering working conditions, especially both internally, but also just along their supply chains or those that are really tied to the corporate commitments that we're seeing today. Well, I want to get into that a little bit because I can imagine that some of our audience at Verge Net Zero is sitting here and thinking, okay, that's all well and good. That's actually not my job. That's someone else at my organization that deals with that part of things. And I think in most cases, considering justice and the human side of this work is sort of at best peripherally a part of most sustainability strategies that I see, at least from companies. So why is it important that everyone is holding this intersectional lens? And is there actually any sort of a business case to be made for a just transition? I mean, absolutely. I'll, I'll start off by saying that it's just, it's the right thing to do. Uh, we have a moral imperative to make sure that nobody is left behind as we're addressing climate change. And right now, as it stands, the same group of people that are most vulnerable to climate impacts are also those that are least responsible for contributing to climate change, and lastly, are those that are poised to be the hardest hit. So that's really a foundational piece that I wanna make sure everyone walks away from. But integrating justice, um, communities, centering humans in things like corporate climate commitments, for example, is not just a nice thing to do or the right thing to do. I think it also has real impacts on the durability and the effectiveness of climate action. And it also has long-term economic outcomes and impacts for businesses. So digging into the business case piece just a little bit more, supporting a just transition can help build resilience to businesses in two different ways that I see it. One is by reducing that systemic risk um, from the unknowns that come with climate change. I mean, there's so many impacts that are going to happen. It's going to happen to everybody and everything, many which are still unknown and it's happening today. So really making sure that we're accounting for that risk is really important. And that's very central to something like a just transition. But the second piece is also increasing that social license to operate. 
uh, especially with a lot of these sort of servant-based uh, businesses and business models that are becoming more profitable, it's incredibly important to gain that societal acceptance um, to your business or your operation or your organization, et cetera, et cetera. Lastly, the way that I sort of look at it is from that federal policy perspective, just given my background. And I think right now there are a lot of incentives and a lot of you know, government interventions that are coming out to really support the private sector and others in this transition. So there's a real opportunity today to get ahead of that curve before those stricter regulations and those standards that are inevitably coming are actually put into place. So I do see an opportunity to start thinking about this today. Can we get a little bit tactical in our last couple of minutes here? We know that a lot of companies miss the mark when they do this, and it can be a bit more of box checking or lip service. So when done well, what does this really look like? What are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, to put it simply, it's ensuring we're not laser focused on emissions, but we're also centering people and the social and environmental impacts of our work. So for businesses, for example, you can start by looking at places like their sustainability reports, right? So ensuring that environmental justice and people are an actual pillar of those reports that also have those desired outcomes and those success metrics that you can actually assess and make sure that you're meeting. Um, at Carbon 180, for example, we're working not only to scale up carbon removal, but we're leveraging our environmental justice initiative to make sure that that scale up isn't just about tons removed. Instead, we're really seeking input from EJ organizations and from uh, academics and community-based organizations to make sure that these technologies and these practices have real outcomes for communities. Um, we've been able to identify a couple guiding principles that I think hold across the board, one being ensuring that benefits that are created are equitably distributed, and also that public engagement is really robust and it's incorporated early. And I just, I really want to outline that it, you don't have to know exactly what to do or how to do it today, but what's really great is there are a lot of savvy, very smart people with a lot of experience in the principles of just transition and also equitable climate action that can really help. I think it's just important to make sure that those people are really well paid and that their input is, is meaningfully incorporated into plans. So important to underscore that point of this is not just about unpaid work and volunteer time and making this sort of a, you know, come on a Tuesday afternoon and you don't have childcare. It's, it's about making it accessible and, and compensating folks for the, the work that they're doing. In our last minute or so, can you give us one example of maybe a company that's doing this well that we can learn from? Yeah, so it's really early stages from the carbon removal perspective, but I think there are places that you can pull from other farther along more advanced fields like solar. Um, so Solar Uptown Now is an initiative that's actually housed at We Act for EJ, which is a New York based environmental justice organization, and they're trying to bring solar energy affordable solar energy to low income communities. So they partner with different groups, including different companies to provide free worker training, help facilitate community ownership, and most importantly, they're working to diversify the workforce. These are all incredibly important uh, pieces to adjust transition, and also the type of business or the type of program that businesses should seek to support or to partner with. There is not enough time for such a rich conversation, and I have so much more I want to ask you, but unfortunately, I have to close it there. Please join me in thanking Ubag Kosar from Carbon 180 for her time and insight. Thank you and so much. I'm sure, I'm sure you all have questions, um, and if you want to continue this conversation, I'm speaking with Ubag's colleague, Rory Jacobson, at 215 Pacific to continue this. It'll be an interactive Ask an Expert session where you can ask your questions and dive into some of the details. But for now, thanks for a great conversation. Thank you.